Hi guys, this is the Limitless Landscapers podcast. I'm Paula and today I'm here with Brian Clayton. As the founder of the Landscaper Circle and the Limitless Landscapers podcast, I am here to help you get more money, time and freedom to make your life and business truly limitless. Through my experiences as the owner of a garden design and landscaping business and through tried and tested methods, if you want help with the marketing, managing and growing of your business, then you are in the right place. If you are a landscaper, garden designer, horticultural business or a supplier to the industry, be sure to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Now, let's get back to the show. So, Brian, as UK listeners and an audience, can you tell them a bit about you? Because not many people may know of you. Some some of them will, but some of them won't. So, can you give us a bit of an overview? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me on, Paula. Uh, my name is Brian Clayton. I am co-founder and CEO of a company called GreenPal. GreenPal is a mobile app that works like Uber, but for lawn mowing services. So if a homeowner needs to hire a landscaping contractor, they just jump on GreenPal, they pop in their address, they get multiple quotes, and then they hire the contractor they want to work with. And essentially as like a connector service for contractors and people who need their services. It's only in the United States right now, but we're nationwide in the United States, around 300,000 people using this app. And, uh, and soon to be in Canada and then UK and then Australia. So we'll, we'll be there soon enough. But for, <laughs> before GreenPal, <clears throat> I actually had a landscaping business. I started mowing grass in high school as a way to make extra cash and um, stuck with a little lawn mowing business for, for uh, almost 15 years. Grew it little by little all through high school, all through college. And over a 15-year period of time, ended up building one of the larger landscaping businesses in the southeastern United States, eventually getting that company over 150 employees, got it over 10 million a year in revenue. And in 2013, the business was acquired by one of the largest landscaping conglomerates in the United States and an acquisition. And so growing that business from just me and like a push mower to me and 150 people, I learned a lot about the landscaping industry, how it worked from the inside out. When I sold it, I took like a year off and just kind of did a bunch of traveling and self-reflecting and realized something that I was really wired to want to be in the game, wired to want to be building a business. And I thought, well, somebody's going to build an app that's going to work like the Uber, but for lawn mowing, why not be me? How hard could it be? And it was kind of naivete as an asset, but got in there, uh, recruited two <laughs> co-founders, taught ourselves how to build software. And here we are now like a 10 year overnight success. So 22 years in, in the green industry, I've kind of seen it from, from every angle you can see it from. Yeah. See, that's what I think is going to be quite inspirational for my audience of landscapes and garden designers i know they'll be thinking how the hell did you grow a landscaping company to 150 people and you know turn over 10 million a year how how did you even go about that how did that even happen yeah it, it was a heck of a journey and uh, you know i think the landscaping business is is one of the greatest businesses that that, that you can start because it teaches you so much about the nuts and bolts that go into running a business that nobody teaches us. So things like customer service, basic marketing, basic accounting, basic economics, basic pricing, ba like all of these things you learn in the landscaping business. And, and you can then apply that to other businesses because these fundamentals are the same for pretty much every industry. And so that's one thing I love about it. It's, it's almost like the greatest small business in the world you can start because the barriers to entries are, are pretty low and you can kind of cut your teeth on entrepreneurship. Or... If you're willing to slug it out and dedicate a decade to it, uh, you can build a big business and, and it is doable. It, it, it is possible. It's just, uh, it's hard. It's challenging. It's hyper competitive. You have to really play the long game and, uh, you know, you have to, you have to go many, many years, uh, of, of, of personal sacrifice really for me to cut your way in to, to build a business uh, of that scale. But it worked for me. The looking back, the way I really kind of understood it and the way it kind of makes sense is looking at it almost like a video game, really. Like 10, 10 levels uh, of Super Mario World, and you just work one level at a time. And, you know, level one, if you're in the landscaping business, might be, I just need 100 customers and 50K in revenue or 75K or 100K in revenue. And don't even worry about anything else until you get to that level. And then level two might be, I need to hire my first employee and you really don't need to worry about anything else until you get that figured out. How do you train this person? How do you pay them a, a good amount? How do you price your services to where you can 
you can uh, you can make all of that stuff make sense. And then level three might be, okay, well now this is just basic duplication. I'm I'm selling labor hours, and now maybe I need three or four employees. And how do I make sure that my pricing lines up with what it costs me to de to deliver that service? And really not worry about anything else. I think a lot of what hangs up uh, landscaping contractors and the people in business in, in general is that they worry about like Bowser related related problems uh, when they're really on level two or three. Uh, yeah. They don't get this. They don't get the sound foundation in place first. So that that's kind of how it makes sense for me looking backwards. Now doing it twice, you know, Green Pal is doing thirty million a year in revenue. So so two businesses, eight figures, no outside capital on either one of them. One thing that makes sense to me is just looking at it like one level at a time, break it down and don't, and focus all of your intensity on that one level. I did have a question actually. So what, um, what made you pick up that? I know you say Uber was, um, a bit of an inspiration to you, I suppose, to, to set up Green Power, but what made you think about that in the first place? Like, where did that idea even come from? And did you ever think it would grow to what it was now? Did you ever really believe that? Or was it just like you say, just going on one step at a time and it becoming this beast, I suppose. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think in, in entrepreneurship and in, in, in founding a business, you get to, it's like you have these dichotomies and one of them is you have to have this huge like vision and then you also have to think and act very, very, very small. So it's like, it was both. So, so when we started, yeah, I didn't start it to build a small business. I wanted to build a nationwide network of, of, of landscaping services and I wanted to get it to at least a hundred million a year in revenue. Right now we're doing 30. So that's our next goal is to get to a hundred. That's the next level of the game, I guess you could say. Yeah. And, and so the idea for uh, the app, you know, to call it the Uber of, the, of, of long hair is kind of a misnomer because Uber really kind of treats their vendors like crap, uh, you know, treats them as like fungible commodities that won't work in the landscaping service. Uh, we really more or less offer, uh, offer a platform for small landscaping services to operate their entire business. And then homeowners can hire them off the shelf, so to speak. Yeah. And so we're kind of we're kind of vendor first because, to be honest, it would never work if you treated landscaping contractors like like Uber drivers. I mean, they're just too independent and and uh, they have other options. But so that's that's where the analogy kind of breaks down. But the idea for it, I mean, I, I always knew it would work because I saw it every day running a landscaping business. As I grew that my, my landscaping company uh, to a hundred plus people. We no longer did residential services. That's kind of the evolution that 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 most landscaping businesses go through. Uh, as you grow and scale, you're now going after the six-figure contracts. You have a sales team in place. You have a sales process. You you are doing multiple millions a year in revenue. And once you get to that point, you you for for better or worse, you no longer have time or no longer are able to service the basic lawn mowing call that yeah. calls it comes into your office. Like, hey, will you come? mow my yard Saturday morning at, you know, 10 o'clock for, for $38, please. Like uh, you're, 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 you're running this huge behemoth. You, you, you just, you just, you cannot make the economics work on that type of, 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 of business. And that's how it was for my company. So every day, you know, I'm sure people listening to this can relate. You get, you get uh, 20 or 30 calls a day, for sometimes as many as a hundred calls a day, people begging us to come cut their grass. And and because they saw our trucks in town or yeah. whatever. And, and they're like, will you please come mow my yard? I called 10 other landscaping contractors and nobody will call me back. And we had a value of running that business to always be helpful, no matter what, yeah. to always try to help people. And, and so we would keep a list of, of names and phone numbers. Um, our receptionists would keep a list of names and phone numbers of smaller service providers, uh, people that were just one, one man or one woman operators who wanted that business, were dying for that business. We're running around all over town, passing out flyers for that business, uh, but they couldn't connect. And, uh, and so we would refer these, these names and numbers out and, and in effect were this connecting service at a very local level. So I knew that the problem existed on both sides of the transaction, that there are smaller contractors who are doing 20 customers who want to do 100, who don't have a marketing budget, don't have time to pass out flyers, don't want to do any of that stuff, don't want to run a, run a Facebook ad campaign don't want to run Google AdWords. And if they did, they, they may lose their shirt doing it. Um, and then there's, there's homeowners who just need this basic service done and they don't want to call and leave 10 voicemails. A lot of times they get stood up and get ghosted. And, and so there needs to be an app in a marketplace where you just push a button and this thing happens and it and adds value for both sides of the transaction. And, and that was the idea then. Now here we are a decade later, we are still uh, focused on that one use case. How do we make 
better matches, better pricing, better route optimization, uh, more convenient for homeowners. How do we make contractors more money with less headache? That's really where we yeah. start. And, and making it to where it, 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 it you know, is a no-brainer for both sides of the, of the equation. Now, if you're running a huge landscaping business like what I had, Green Pal is irrelevant. But if you uh, are getting, right, let's say you quit your job or got laid off or fired or, uh, and you've got 10, 10 lawn mowing customers and you want 100, boy, do I have a product for you. This is the best platform for that type of scenario in the United States. Uh, and we've got thousands of stories of people who have made, you know, six figures for the first time in their life uh, mowing yards on Green Pal. It's awesome. And what do you think your success is with Green Power? Is it the marketing? Is it the way you're, like you said, you care about both sides of the coin? You, there is obviously a problem that exists there. What would you say, say was like your big, yeah, what, what makes Green Power enable these one man bands, so to speak, to make that much money when they couldn't do it for themselves? Is it the marketing? Is it the sales presence? What? Yes, yeah, great Nick. question. You know, it's never one thing, it's always like, um, it's, it's always a combination of a lot of things done right. For us, uh, some, of the bigger th the, some of the bigger things would be authenticity as a competitive advantage. So in, in the United States and maybe even in, in, in Europe as well, in the wake of Uber, um, there was a bunch of venture capital that, that flooded into these Uber for uh, X ideas. So Uber for home cleaning, Uber for laundry service, Uber for... Uh, car valet service, Uber for car washing, Uber for anything. And 99% of them crashed and burned. There were, there were a dozen uh, Uber for lawn mowing services that popped up in the United States and, and, and we're us and, and one other are the only ones around still. And so for us, I think is, is one of our silver bullets, I guess you could say, would be authenticity as a competitive advantage. Because I spent you know 15 years in the landscaping business, I have the scars on my hands and I, you know, I literally, you know, I mean, I can still weed eat better than anybody I know. Um, you know, it's like, I, I know how hard it is to make a living uh, in this, in this industry. And so we solve for that first, yeah. you know, if we can't make contractors more money with less headache, then we don't have a platform. We don't have a, a marketplace. We don't have a business. And so that's where we started. And so that kind of helped, um, all, everything else kind of cascade from that. And it helped, of course, correct a lot of things. Whereas most Uber for home cleaning, Uber for whatever ideas started from the consumer first and treated suppliers as like fungible commodities. And that's not really how it works in the real world. You know, in, in, in you, you want the same landscaping service every single week. You want the same uh, whatever home cleaning service every week. And, and you want to power that relationship. So that was one thing we got right. But that's not enough. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of table stakes. There's, there's, a, there's a saying that first-time founders worry about product and second-time founders worry about distribution. And so what that means is like the first-time founder, and I was guilty of this, is, na is naive to think that if they build a great product that, that everything else take care of itself. Whereas the second-time founder knows because they they've been around the block, they, they know that, yeah, great product. Sure, that's table stakes. You got to get that right. How are we going to get people to use this damn thing? Because that's all that matters. And so for us, the platform's success, Green Pal's success, and our contractors' success is a function of how can we draw consumers to the platform and get them to find out about it, get them to try it out, get them to hire their contractor on top of our technology, and get them to, to, to do business with the vendors that use our platform and make our vendors more money. Uh, it's a function of how many consumers use the app, and that's that's more or less what drives our success. Everything else is table stakes. Yeah. And so we've gotten really good. We're like one of the preeminent marketers of landscaping services in the United States and soon to be the world, uh, because if we're not good at that, then contractors have no reason to use it. Um, yeah. You, you know, there there there's there's SaaS tools already available for billing, invoicing, and all of these things we get contractors more business and give them free tools for route optimization, getting paid quickly, organizing CRM and all of these things. So is that all done within the app? Is yes. Uh, so, 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 it's, so it's, there's a saying in building a marketplace like this, come for the, the network, stay for the tools. And yep. so uh, we have to give like a, a whole suite of SaaS tools for free <clears throat> to contractors that use it. So everything from quoting in a snap, 
rather than having to drive out to a homeowner's property, look at it, measure it, leave them a written estimate, you can quote 20 properties in five minutes. Uh, we present the contractor with all sorts of rich data around the aerial imagery, street view imagery, the data we pull in from uh, a bunch of different uh, sources like lot size, uh, how, you know, is there a pool, is there a fence, all of these things to where you can uh, li literally go through, okay, uh, that's $85, that's $55, that's $65, boom, boom, boom. And then that's all set to the homeowners for them to hire uh, the contractor. And, and so that's a, that's a tool set that we give contractors who use our platform. Then, you know, invoicing, uh, and then the invoice getting paid in 24 hours is a big piece. You know, the, yeah. the lawn care guy is always the last to get paid. We solve that problem by retaining the card on file for the homeowner and, and getting them paid within 24 hours. And then downstream things like CRM, who are all my customers? Uh, where, where's all their contact information? Um, when have they last done business with me? Uh, what, what, are they cold now? Do I need to, do I need to nudge them? And then the, the, the marketing automation on the back end of, okay, Hey, Mrs. Smith, uh, you haven't quoted her shrub pruning or her seating. It's fall. She's going to need both those services. Submit the quote. We'll, we'll nudge her three or four times to get her to book those services with you. Things like that to, to upsell and make more money. Uh, and put more money in the pockets of, of contractors that use our platform. And you built this with, did you build this like no funding whatsoever, just your own, no investment or did you have to crowdfund? How did you sort of get around that sort of? Uh... Yeah, you know, most of the time tech startups like ours and, and ones that are building a marketplace like ours are just like cash, sponges for cash. It takes mm. a lot of cash to get one of these off the ground. And that's okay, but it's been my experience that like, Revenue is the best form of funding when starting any business. Uh, you know, some businesses you you, you got to have capital to start. Like let's say you want it, like back in the day when all these scooter companies were just coming out of the woodwork. That's a that's a that's a hardware intense business. It's one that's obvious. It just takes a bunch of capital. There's no way to bootstrap a, a scooter company. But most software businesses, most small businesses, most traditional businesses, you can you can self fund. Meaning you get five customers, take that money, put it back to work get 10 and mm -hmm. then get a hundred, get a thousand, get 10,000 and so on. That's how we did it. Uh, but it was really tough. The first four or five years were, were excruciating. Uh, my two co-founders and I went, went without a salary for like two years. Um, and, and they worked day jobs as, as, as we worked on this thing uh, together nights and weekends. But uh, there was a lot of, I just started seeing a lot of companies that, you know, had raised 10, $20 million. And then 18 months later, they were out of business. And I thought something is, is, is not working here. And I don't want to do that. I, I, this is like, I, I've got one good idea and I have to make this one good idea work. I, I can't, I can't crash and burn this thing in 24 months and then go start something else because I don't have any other good ideas. And so I just thought I'm going to go slow and low. We're going to make 10 grand and we're going to put 9,500 of it back to work and then, and then compound those numbers is how we did it. It just took us a long time. So it's doable. It's just challenging to do it that way. Yeah. But like you say, I think that that was what when when I was reading about green power and stuff it was quite interesting because you do see these tech startups and they do get lots of investment first. So and like you say, they tend to crash and burn quickly. A lot uh, of times, and 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 you know, unless you've done it two or three times before, it's kind of hard to know how to put a million or ten million dollars to work. I, I would have made the same mistake myself. It's kind of like putting rocket fuel into a toy and it just blowing apart, or putting like rocket boosters on the side of like a wooden barn. It just, until you've got it figured out or you're an experienced operator, it's really challenging to, to put that kind of money to work. And what would be your biggest tip for a landscaper to grow their business? If they're, you know, they're just starting out, they maybe have a team. What would be your biggest tip for them to grow their business? Maybe not to 10 million, maybe, you know, just to a million would be good. Yeah, the, owning or operating a business is the greatest thing you can do with your life because it's going to cause you to level up. It's going to cause you to grow. It's going to cause you to evolve. I am what I am today because of 22 years in business. And, you know, in 10 years or shoot, in two or three years, I'll be a completely different person. I think you should be evolving into a whole new person every two or three years running your business. And, and in business, you're doing three things at one time. There's a great book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yep, right and now. in that book, he, he really talks about uh, you're working in the business and then you're working on the business. And, and so most landscape contractors spend 99% of their time working in the business, 
putting out, they're playing like whack-a-mole every day, uh, just returning customer phone calls, uh, fixing broken equipment, um, employees didn't show up, bailing employees out of jail. Uh, I've done that dozens <laughs> That's of times. That's a fun one. I've done that yet. <laughs> L- literally, driven my, literally driven my rig to the jail and bailed out an employee, <laughs> and he jump in and we go to work. I've done that multiple times, and people listening to this probably can relate. So there's all kinds of just like, whack-a-mole type of things you're doing on a daily basis just trying to hold the damn thing together and that's working in the business and and then so you're, you're sitting here thinking i don't have any time to work on the business i'm just i'm just literally i'm gonna try to hold this thing together and the reality is you have to make time uh you have to dedicate at least five or ten percent of your time in level one of the game to working on the business you know why, why do I have an employee that's in jail? Well, I have a problem with, with employee recruiting and I probably shouldn't have hired this guy or, or, uh, why, you know, ask like, why, uh, am I not making any money? Why can't I make payroll? Well, you know, let's go back to what we're pricing work at and, and what are we, what are we really selling? We're selling labor hours and, and what are the dynamics of how we, how we price that and how we recover our, 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 our operating expenses. And, Really just trying to figure out, okay, what does my pricing strategy look like? What does my marketing strategy look like? What does my route density strategy look like? That's working on the business. And that might be a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday thing. And the reality is, is most landscaping contractors aren't, you know, they may be working seven days a week, but they're doing, they're working in the business. They're not working on the business. And, and they're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, movement and conflating movement and activity with success and prosperity. And they're like, I'm already working seven days a week. I'm coming in on Sunday and sharpening lawnmower blades and I'm burnt out and I don't have any time for this. And it's like, well, it's actually harder to, to do that hard work on the business and, and, and develop these systems and processes than it is to just go and like jump in the truck and, 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 and look busy. So that's where a lot of new business owners, new, new landscaping contractors go wrong is, is not balancing those two things. The third new thing I'll add to the equation that I haven't heard talked about anywhere else that maybe Michael Gerber should write like a follow-up to E-Myth <laughs> is the third thing that you're doing. So you're working in the business, you're working on the business. And then the third thing you're doing is you're working on yourself. You have to learn leadership. You le- have to learn management. You have to learn basic bookkeeping, basic economics, basic, basic sales, basic pricing strategy, systems, processes, routines. You have to learn these things and you have to pick up books. You have to listen to audio books. You got to go, go to YouTube University. What a time to be alive. You can learn these things from anywhere at any time for free. In most cases, you have to go to conferences. You have to work on yourself uh, and you have to level up. And if you don't, you're going to be stuck in level one of the game or level two of the game, running a landscaping business, barely making ends meet and getting pissed off and hating the industry. And, and, uh, and, you know, looking at guys like me and, and, and wondering how, you know, how do they do it? And it's like, you're working on the business, you're working in the business and you're working on yourself. And a lot of, and 99% of the landscape contractors don't do that. And so hopefully somebody listening to this is like, you know what? He's right. I'm going to, I'm going to every, every Sunday, I'm going to read for three hours and in the truck, I'm turning off the music and I'm turning on audiobooks or podcasts or YouTube university. Uh, your, 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 your vehicle is going to have to become a mobile classroom. Your living room is going to have to become a classroom. You're going to have to turn off Netflix and turn on YouTube and, and learn the skills that you're going to have to learn. And then, and the last thing I'll say is this, uh, there's a great book called the Cash Flow quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. And in the book, he talks about the, the stark difference between, uh, owning a business and being self-employed. And there is a big, big difference. And, um, most landscaping contractors don't know the difference. I know I didn't. Um, and 99% of landscaping businesses are self-employed and they do not own a business. So read that book. It'll tell, it'll, it'll explain in, in, in good detail what the difference is between the two and, and how do you get out of the quadrant of self-employed into the quadrant of owning a business. That sounds good. That is exactly it. And is that, uh, would that be how you yourself continue to up-level when you're working on your own personal development? Is that how you feel when you up-level or just by running a different type of business and learning as you go? How would you explain, because you said, you know, in every two to three years, you should be up-leveling yourself. And how does it look to you? Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, you know, that was one of the things that confronted me uh, 
when starting Green Pal was was how ill prepared I, I was to, to run a tech company. Uh, here I am, you know, I had an eight figure landscaping company, sold it for for millions and millions and millions of dollars, and and uh, the biggest acquisition in the, in in that industry in the decade. And here I am thinking I know everything there is to know about business. And then I started Green Pal, and I was quickly confronted with, "Wow, you don't know, you don't know squat about playing this game." And so I had to learn. It took like three years. I had to learn how to build a tech company, how to build a marketplace, how to how to code, how to build software, how to do all these things. And it was really, really humbling. And that's one of the cool things about running a business at any level, whether it's just you mowing twenty yards or you with twenty employees. You know, it's humbling uh, because you're confronted with all of these hard, challenging problems you have to solve, and 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 are you up to it or not? And so for me, the business is always that thing that causes me to level up, causes me to pick up books. And a lot of times I'm reading and learning things that's kind of block and tackling for whatever stage of the game that I'm in. So with Green Pal, you know, there was six months where all I read and all I learned was 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 copywriting. I knew that I had to become a decent copywriter to create good sales copy for Green Pal and to write the words that you see on a screen. As it turns out, words on a screen are really important. And, and I had to learn like the 80, 20 of good copywriting and had to do that with a lot of different skills. And, and so, and, and as, as you know, it relates to a small landscaping contractor, you know, some of that might be management leadership. How do you become a good leader? How do you become the type of leader, small business owner that people want to come work for? You need to be reading books about from John Maxwell and, and Simon Sinek and, and the list goes on and on and on and on about what kind of leadership style do you want to build? Well, you might say, well, I, I just have two employees. Well, you're a leader and you need to like develop that. And it's going to take about five years to become a good leader, but you need to start that now. And the business is requiring that of you. And I, and you know, five years from now, you'd be like, yeah, man, he, you know, this business is, is, has caused me to, to, to develop a person, like a leadership style. I never had that. So that's one of the cool things about it. Yeah, absolutely agree. And when do you think, um, well, when's your plan to have green power over in the UK? So we're nationwide in the United States, but we still have a, a, a ways to go until we've reached kind of full, like, uh, I guess you could say saturation. Yeah. So the next is Canada, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, early, early next year. And then after we figure out the nuances of launching into an, an international market, it's harder than I thought. Uh, these, these invisible <laughs> another lines. Another up level. <laughs> yeah. Another, another, le another, uh, final boss at, at another level of the game, uh, um, you know, it's harder than I, than I thought it would be. These, these imaginary lines between us are very real. And, and so, so once we figure that out, then we'll develop a playbook and, and then we'll figure out a way to, to, to scale out into other, other countries that are a good fit. Sounds good. I think it sounds awesome. Well, thank you for coming on our podcast. And I hope that someone out there has taken something from it. There's loads of nuggets in there. So. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Uh, anybody who wants to hit me up, find me on Instagram, Brian M. Clayton. Just drop me a DM there. Cool. I'll put all the, all the contact details and everything in the show notes anyway, but thank you, Brian. It's been awesome. Thanks, Paula. I appreciate it. <laughs>